Okay, so how is everyone today? Awesome. So how was the exam? Was it everything you hoped it would be? So shh, 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 shh. we got to get get going. So any questions about the exam? When is it going to be graded? Oh. Uh, probably by Monday. Yeah, it'll be up in the grade book by Monday, I think. Other questions? Are all the lights on? Okay, so what were we talking about last time? We're talking about transformations of functions. Okay, and the last thing that we talked about last time was the parity of functions. <coughs> and I don't mean parody like making fun of. I mean parity like even or odd. Uh, so to remind you, Today's the 18th, and then what, what we said last time is that in the case that you have a function f, and in the case that uh, f of negative x is f of x, that is to say that negating the input has no effect then such, such functions are important enough to have a special name. What's the name for such functions? Even. Okay, so this is even. And then if you, if you take the input and you negate it, and then that turns out to be the same thing as negating the output, so negating the input results in negating the output, then, then such functions are called what? Odd. Well, that's what this one is. Negating the input is the same as negating the output. <coughs> this one is negating the input is the same as doing nothing. Uh, so functions can be even or odd, and they, they can be neither, just like numbers. So what's an example of an even number? Eight is even. What's an example of an odd number? Seven. Seven. What's an example of a, of a number which is neither? Three and a third is neither is neither, because evenness evenness is is construed as you you take away two until you can't take away any more. And if you have three and a third, and you take away two, then now you have one and a third. And so, you know we could we could say we could do this process with eleven. Say you take away two, then you have nine. Take away two, then you have. 7, take away 2, then you have 5, take away 2, then you have 3, take away 2, then you have 1. So when, this, when you finish this process, if there are 0 left over, the number is even. If there is 1 left over, the number is odd. If, if neither of these things occur, then, then the number is, is neither 1. Okay, good. So for that reason, 0 is even, right? Because <laughs> after you take away 2 uh, from 0, as many groups of two as you can, how many are left over? Zero. So zero is even. <clears throat> okay. So for example, how about uh, the function f of x is x cubed and then divided by x squared plus 5. Uh, and the question is, is this even? odd or neither <laughs> so which one okay well notice that the algebraic test they both are asking a question about well what would happen if you negate the input in the case that there's no change in the output it's an even function. In the case that the output is negated, it's an odd function. But in, either, in, in both cases, you need to check what happens if you negate the input. So that's where you start. 
Okay, well let's consider f of negative x. So that is to say, in this definition right here, everywhere that you see x, replace it with negative x. So negative x and then that all cubed, negative x and that squared, and then plus 5. And now we need to work with this expression and see how we can simplify it. So 5 is already as simple as it gets, so that's good. So I'll leave the numerator alone for a minute, and I'll ask, well, the term in the bottom left, how can we simplify that term? What is negative x squared? Yeah, it's the same as x squared. Uh, the reason is because the negative, in a sense, squares away. Because this, what I'm saying on this step is that negative x squared, well, you could look at this as uh, negative x multiplied by negative x. And then you could factor, you could consider that those negatives to be multiplication by negative 1. So negative 1 times x, negative 1 times x and then factor those negative ones to the front, negative one squared and then x squared. And well, what is negative one squared? No, <laughs> the square root of negative one is i, but negative one, negative one squared is one. So the negative squares away. Okay. What about, what about the term in the numerator? Does the, does the, will the negative cube away? Like the negative squared away for this one? Does it cube away? No, it won't, right? Because, uh, well, because we have an odd number of negatives. So, so uh, the way to write this is negative and then x cubed, like so. OK. So now I'm going to make one more step. And that is I'm going, I want to know, is, uh, is this expression the same as that one or that one? So is it the same? So, so is this expression exactly the same as this one? It's not exactly the same. But what if we were to factor out a negative? That is to say, what if we say negative and then this? What do I need to write in here to make that right? Uh, x cubed over negative x squared minus 5. Uh, not quite. Is it close? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of close. So what you, what you s suggested was we'd have to factor out more than one negative. So we're just, just, this, just this negative right here. So x squared plus 5. This is what it would be if we did that. But this, term, this, this expression in the big round parentheses that I'm covering up, we already have a name for that. What's its name? It's f of x, right? So this would be negative f of x. So what we've said is that negating the input is the same as negating the output. So what's the conclusion about f? It's odd. Any question about this one? OK. How about how about h of x is 4x cubed plus 2x and then divided by x to 5 
plus 8x. Why not? Okay, same question. Even, odd, or neither. So how do we, how do we address this question? Mm -hmm. the, it's all, it, to, to, to begin the question of if it's even, odd, or neither, you always ask, well, what happens when I negate the input? Okay. So suppose we negate the input. Replace all of the x's with negative x's. carry this through to its logical conclusion. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, for this one, just, just that term in the top left, how can it be simplified? Does the negative cube away? It doesn't cube away. It, if that exponent was, say, 30 instead of 3, well, 30 is even, so in that case, it would it would 30 away <laughs> 30th power away <clears throat> uh, so that top left term can be written as negative 4x cubed how about the, the top right one right minus 2x good and then how how does the denominator read mm-hmm minus 8x. Okay. So now the question is, is can we make, can we make this look exactly like that or the negation of that? Okay, well, let's start out by simplifying as much as we can. So notice in the numerator that we could factor out a negative 1. So if we do that in the numerator, so I'll just focus on the numerator for a minute. If we factor out negative 1 in the numerator, then what would I have to write in there? Very good. 4x cubed plus 2x. Uh, we could, but, but that is, wouldn't lead us closer to the answer. But I, I agree that you could. Okay, so do you, what I want you to observe now is that you could uh, also factor a negative one out of the denominator. And if you were to do this, then it would look like x to 5 plus 8x. And now you can cancel the negative ones, numerator and denominator and you obtain that the numerator is 4x cubed plus 2x divided by x to 5 plus 8x. So what's that telling us? It's even, right? It's saying that, you know, this, this is exactly h of x. But we're saying that the way we got h of x was from negating the input. So negating the input is the same as having done nothing at all. So, so therefore, h is even. Any question about this one? Yes? I'm just overall, just exactly the whole thing. <laughs> well, okay. I'm sorry. So, Generally speaking, if you have a function f, the parity test is this, is that you take the function and instead of plugging in x, you plug in negative x. So after algebraic, after algebra, if you end up getting f of x, then f is even. 
if after algebra <laughs> you get negative f of x, the result is odd, and then after possibly after some other from, from, from algebra, if you get neither one of these, you don't get f of x, you don't get negative f of x, then it, it's, the answer is that it is neither. So to complete the possibilities, how about let's consider p of x is, say, um, x cubed plus, uh, plus 8. And then the same question as before, is it even or odd or neither? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we'll negate the input and observe what happens. So I, we can simplify this. to get negative x cubed plus 8. So now, is this exactly like what we began with? No. It's not. So maybe we could factor out a negative, and it will be the opposite of what we began with. So um, <clears throat> let's factor out a negative. If we factor out a negative out of this, what would we, what, what would we have? It'd have to be minus 8 because we're factoring out a negative. So now is this thing exactly what we started with? No, it's not. So what's the conclusion about P? It's, neither. it's neither, right? Because, because this is not P of X and because this is not negative P of X, because of this, it's not even. Because of this, it's not odd. So it's neither one. It would look like this. So here's a function where we said, well, here's a function. Plug in negative x. And then right here on this step, I asked, is this exactly f? And y'all said, nope, it's not. So I said, well, what would it look like if we factored a negative out of that expression? And then we did that. And then I, and then I observed, oh, but that's f. So the negative is outside the parentheses. It's inside the parentheses. It's exactly, it's exactly what? Mm -hmm. So as a result, it's on. Yes? OK. So I get it. Like, we have <laughs> <laughs> well, so. The, 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 the simplest and, and, e and easiest answer is to say that in two weeks you're going to have a quiz and this is going to be one of the questions. <laughs> okay. Alternatively, I could say, well, presumably you're here because you have some professional aspiration. And <laughs> presumably. And this is one of the stepping stones. And then uh, otherwise, uh, to, to have a scientific or math answer, is that um, re re remember that last time we talked about whether or not what, what it visually means for a function to be even. It means that it has a horizontal symmetry. So, like for example, human human bodies have a ha have a symmetry across the vertical axis. So, in that sense, we're even. So, so this happens in in real life. And then another place in real life would be. If you are, if you are, if you can, so, so can you remember the child's toy, uh, a seesaw? Uh, imagine a, imagine a, a more interesting one where instead of it being a stick that each of you are on, imagine it being a, a disc, right? So that you're, you know, you both got to stay balanced. So if, if you take a step forward toward the, toward the center, then your counterpart must also to stay balanced. But if you take a step right, then your counterpart has to take a step, would be left according to you, right? So, so what's happening is that they have to do the opposite of you. So that, that the symmetry in that situation is odd symmetry. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, fine, so now we'll briefly talk about absolute value functions. So th this is section 3. Point, uh, I don't know, 6. But because of the way that we covered all the other things, there's really nothing to say in this section because we already said everything there is to say. So in the first place, uh, the definition of the absolute value is for the fifth time or something, x when x is greater than or equal to 0 and negative x when x is less than 0. And also for the fifth time or so, I'll ask the expression negative x. Is it possible that negative x could ever be positive? Yeah. If x is negative, negative x is positive, for example, when x is negative 10, because then negative x would be negative negative 10, which is 10. So this comes as a great surprise to many students in college algebra, um, for, for the obvious reason that it's kind of weird to think that if its name is negative x, it could still be positive. Okay, but it, it just can be. Okay. Second is that the shape of the absolute value function is what? A V. Okay, good. So now here's an example. Suppose that we have the function f of x is 4 multiplied by x minus 3. And then how about um, plus 2? Okay, my first request of you is please find its uh, x-intercepts. So what, what does that mean? Right. So this is, these are all the locations where y is equal to 0. And then construing functions to be machines that you give them inputs and they produce for you outputs, what it's saying is, tell me all the inputs so that the output would be 0. That's what you're saying. So what we need to do is we need to solve f of x is equal to 0 for x. Tell me the inputs so that the output is 0. OK. So uh, for absolute x minus 3 plus 2 equal to 0. Okay, what do we need to do to solve this equation? Okay, good. Move the 2 over. So 4 absolute x minus 3 equal to negative 2. Then what? Divide by 4. Okay. Absolute x minus 3 is, well, negative 2 over 4 is negative half. Now what? Two different equations? You're, you're having an echo, but a wrong echo. Okay. You're, ha you're having a memory, but a false memory. It's not possible. Why is this not po why, why is there no solution to this equation? Yeah. Right. Because you have to ask yourself, well, I'm obscuring what's inside of the absolute value, but let me ask myself in principle, is there anything I could give to that absolute value so that it would provide back to me negative half. Yeah. No, there isn't. There's nothing that, that we could give it. So the answer is that, there are, that there's no solution. And that's fine. What does that mean about the x-intercepts? There, no there aren't any. And this is fine.
It's extremely important when you're doing a math or science or business or what have you problem for if someone asks you, well, tell us what we need to do so that we can achieve that. And it's, it's very good of you to be able to say that actually it's not possible to achieve that for these reasons. Because, <laughs> because otherwise, you might, if it's a business situation, you might find yourself spending months and months and months uh, trying to achieve something that in fact is not achievable. Okay. <clears throat> so how about uh, the y-intercept? What does that mean? Where x is 0. So now, now, again, considering functions to be machines which you provide inputs and they produce outputs, what this is saying is that what would the output be if you happen to make the input 0? What would you get if you did that? OK. So f of, f of 0 is equal to plug in 0. So that'd be 4 multiplied by negative 3 absolute value, and then plus 2. Well, what is that? Fourteen, right? Because absolute of negative three is positive three times four is twelve. Two more is fourteen. Okay. So where's the so where's the y-intercept? Zero fourteen. Okay. Now. Three. Uh, please describe the transformation. Which which does the following? Which do, which changes y is absolute value of x, which is the one that you know to look like that. Okay, to this one. Y is four absolute value x minus 3, and then add 2. So this is, the, there's, a, a, there's a way to transform the typical, the, the, the standard y is absolute to this one. So what I want from you is to say, well, horizontal, this, vertical, that, and, and all that kind of thing. Okay. Well, in order to get it right, you need to make sure that all the, all the little numbers, 4 and 3 and 2 and all of that, they all go with, they're all uh, partnered up with who, who they belong with. So, so this 2 is affecting something. Which variable is it affecting? It's affecting y, actually. It's affecting the output. So let's move it over to b with y. So this is a little better. <coughs> So as a result of this, you can see that, oh, what, what is this going to imply about the transformation? So is, will this be vertical? Yeah. Will it be vertical or horizontal? Vertical, because we're playing with y. And then will it be a shift or a scale? A shift. How can you tell? Because it's subtraction. OK, so then. Uh, so it's going to be vertical, and it's going to be a shift. Is it going to be down or up? The plot is the plot going to move down or up? Plot moves up because the coordinate system is moving down. Okay, good. So we've we've established that much. So now this four, is this four playing with the inputs or playing with the outputs? Outputs. It's playing with the y's, actually. It's playing with the y's because of this. It's not playing with the x's because it's not inside of the absolute value.
So as a result, there's three transformations going on. What are the three transformations? We already said this one. So there's a vertical shift of two. What's this one going to mean? Scale. Okay, so this will be a vertical scale of how much? Four. And then what does this one indicate? Horizontal shift of three. Okay. So now let's sketch that. So now, before we sketch it, I want to ask. Uh, I'm going to draw the horizontal axis a little lower. Before we sketch it, I want to ask. Um, we said that there were no x-intercepts. Why, why does that agree with what we discovered about the transformation? The plot is going to move up. The, the, the coordinate system is going to move down. Right. So consider this red V here. Suppose I grab it and I pull it up. Well, how many times would it be touching this axis if I grab it and pull it up? <laughs> well, once right now. Yeah, not even once after, after we pull it up. OK. So as a result, uh, this, this pointy spot right here, as a result of the, of the shifts, is going to shift up to and right three. So uh, what was it? One, two, three. Yeah, right here. It's going to be right there. Furthermore, besides that pointy spot, we also know this y-intercept. This y-intercept is going to be at 0, 14. So that's like way up here, something like that. And then after that, it's just got to be a V. Yeah, it's a vertical scale of four. So it's, it, it's, it's not so much that it's squeezing it this way. That's not really what's happening. What's really happening is that you're stretching it this way. Okay. Any question about this? Yes? So if you're no, because vertical is indicating that it's up or down, and two means up. So a vertical shift of negative two means down two. Correct. Other questions? Okay. Exciting. So now, what time is it? Good. So now we're in section what? Section 3.7. and it is called inverse functions. So now, this, um, so in, in the course, uh, we end up going over, I don't know how many sections, how many textbook sections, but it's on the order of like 30. We go, we go over about 30 sections, and um, this one is probably in the top four for difficulty. Okay, so I'm just warning you, I'm not trying to scare you or anything like that. I'm just saying that, OK, here comes kind of a difficult bite. OK, so uh, in order to kind of ease the difficulty of it, I'm going to talk about some things that you already know, but I'm going to talk about them in kind of a weird way. 
okay? Because if I talk about these things you already know in this weird way, then it's sort of a smaller jump for me to talk about this new thing that you've never heard of, more or less never heard of before, unless you've taken college algebra before. Okay. So, this is stuff about addition. So, the number zero is called the additive identity because x plus 0 is what? x for all x. So 0 is called the additive identity because it's the only number that you can add to x and it's the same as having done nothing. Right? If you add 3, that's going to change it's going to change it. If you, if you add negative 4, that's going to change it. But adding 0, that's the same as doing nothing. So 0 is referred to as the additive identity. So two numbers x and y are called are called additive inverses when when what when you add them and get what? Zero. <laughs> when you add two numbers, and the result is the additive identity. So what's the additive inverse of three? Negative, negative three. Why is negative three the additive inverse of three? Because the addition of three and negative 3 is 0, which is the additive identity. Okay, so these are all things that you already knew before you got here, but now I'm sort of saying it in this very lockstep fashion. Okay, so the formula for additive inverse. is negation. Which is to say the additive additive inverse of x is negative x. Okay? So last statement we need to make. Which numbers have an additive inverse? All of them do, right? The, well, does 0 have an additive inverse? Well, what's, what's the additive inverse of 3? Negative 3. What's the additive, additive inverse of negative 5? 5. What's the additive inverse of 0? 0. zero. Because, given the number 0, if you negate it and get 0 and then add them together, what do you get? 0. zero. So 0 is the additive inverse of 0. So all numbers. Have an additive inverse. Okay. These are all things that you knew. Now let's talk about multiplication. So the number 
So by analogy now. So for addition, we said that the number zero is the additive identity. So what's going to be the multiplicative identity? Zero. Not zero. One. It's going to be one. It's going to be one. So the number one is called the multiplicative identity because, because why? Anything times one is itself. So, one, and one is the only number that has this property. So you multiply something by one, that's the same as having done nothing. Two numbers, x and y, are called multiplicative inverses when what? So now this is by analogy to, to this. Yeah. When you, you multiply them and get the multiplicative inverse, or the multiplicative identity. So two numbers are called additive inverses when you add them and you get the additive identity. And two numbers are set called multiplicative inverses when you multiply them and you get the multiplicative identity. <laughs> I'm sorry? For example, so, so the formula, so the formula for multiplicative, multiplicative inverse is reciprocal. Okay. That is to say, uh, the multiplicative inverse of x is 1 over x. Okay, now by analogy here, so when we were talking about addition, we said all numbers have an additive inverse. Now, how about multiplicative inverse? All numbers but zero. So now all non-zero numbers have a multiplicative inverse. Now, some students say uh, I can ask, well, why doesn't zero have a multiplicative inverse? That's the usual response, but that's actually not the reason. I, I agree entirely that you can't divide by zero. I make no dispute. But that's not the reason why zero doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. The reason why it doesn't have one is because consider this equation. Zero multiplied by y is equal to one. What y would solve this equation? There aren't any. This is why 0 doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. It is also why you cannot divide by 0, because this equation can have no solution. This is why. So this has no solution. So one thing I'd like for you to observe about multiplication is that, um, is that some numbers, uh, let, 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 let's ask first, what's the multiplicative inverse of 5? 1 fifth. What's the multiplicative inverse of negative 3? Negative 1 third. What's the multiplicative inverse of 2 thirds? 3 halves. 
What's the multiplicative inverse of one? One. one. Wow, that's interesting. So one is its own multiplicative inverse. So that's not too surprising because zero is its own additive inverse. What's the multiplicative inverse of negative one? Negative one. Negative one is also its own multiplicative inverse because what's negative one times negative one? One, which is the multiplicative identity. So what I want you to see from that is that multiplication is already more complicated than addition because it has, not only is the multiplicative inverse of one equal to itself, the multiplicative inverse of negative one is also equal to itself. So we don't talk about it in this class, but when you have an operation where some, some thing is its own inverse, those, those items are called involutions. So, so addition only has one involution, but multiplication already has two. So now, here's the thing. The first thing we're going to do next time is that we talked about identities, inverses, and formulas for addition. We talked about identities, inverses, and formulas for multiplication. And now we're going to talk about the exact same thing, but for functions. So functions have an identity. There can be functions that are inverse to each other. And furthermore, when, they, when you have two functions which are inverse to each other, we're going to have a method to compute the inverse of a function. And furthermore, not all functions are going to be invertible. Just, just like not all functions, not all numbers are multiplicatively invertible. So specifically what we're doing is that this was addition, this was multiplication, and on Friday we're going to talk about composition. Compositional identity, <laughs> compositional identity, compositional inverse, and, comp and the formula for a compositional, uh, computing a compositional inverse. And we'll do that on Friday. So have a nice uh, Wednesday.